So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, today I want to talk to you about an introduction to decoupling for higher dimensional zero curvature hypersurfaces. Uh, we'll define what those are um, and get into the initial attempt for tackling this, this topic. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, it wasn't working at first. All right. Uh, here's an outline for the uh, sections of this talk. I want to first provide an introduction to you all. Um, not sure how we are doing with decoupling here, if, uh, if you all are familiar with that field, but we'll just touch base on sort of the basics of decoupling and move uh, with increasing speed towards the main result. And then we'll discuss the proof in three dimensions, and then what begins to look different if you move into four plus dimensions. Okay, this is the notation that will recur throughout this talk. Um, this goes into what time, by the way? What time should I? Okay, so about 4.20. Okay, uh, right, so we have the usual abbreviation for the complex exponential function. <clears throat> uh, there will be uh, the usual distinguish uh, distinction between points in frequency space and time space. Uh, all functions here will be uh, in short space, so that in particular Fourier inversion applies. Um, now the Fourier projection uh, is a core uh, tool that we need here. Uh, you're just taking the Fourier transform of any function f and then restricting the frequency domain to some set s and then transforming back. Uh, if you will be uh, a symbol always used for the moment curve in RN. Okay, I think that should be pretty customary. Now, because we are wanting to look at hypersurfaces uh, primarily, we also need one more de definition here. And this will be for the statement of the main result. Um, so for this talk, a cap is specified to be a subset S that lies within some sort of like delta uh, translation or, or translations of some cylinder over the tangent plane that moves at most delta in the, the uh, direction of the normal vector. Um, now, this is not the first time that such a definition has occurred in the literature for this um, subset of harmonic analysis uh, and work by Yosevich, Sawyer, and Seeger on the uh, buchner reese problem for, finite, for uh, convex domains of finite line type they posit such a definition there. Um, and it's because of work that was done by Bruno, Bruna, um, Nagel, and Wenger uh, for decay estimates for Fourier transforms of such um, of boundaries of such convex finite line type domains. Um, when you take such a measure and you look at the Fourier transform, uh, the bound that they produced was in terms of the inverse of these, uh, the inverse of the volume of such sets that I have here um, on the right of the set containment. So the decoupling that we will produce will be one that is in terms of caps, the caps uh, that are given here relative to delta will be the elements of our decoupling partition. Um, and this will all recur when we get to the main result. Okay, so now let's discuss what is decoupling. Given some wave f or a function f that we are thinking, uh, conceptualizing as a wave, we may want information about f by studying the composite waves whose frequencies lie within certain regions. So to emphasize that the Fourier support of f is in a set s, I'm using the, uh, we're using the Fourier projection uh, notation here. And then on the frequency side of things, we break up our set S into smaller sets SI. Uh, and this is reflected on the left by a decomposition of our PSF function. Now, if we are only looking at the L2 norm of PSF by Plancherel, we of course have the usual square root cancellation. Uh, and this is exact. You have an exact equality for L2. You may want to extend that to LP for general P. Um, and initially we would have this inequality deduced by interpolation with the um, standard L infinity estimate, uh, just the most fundamental one that you could think of that would be 
true in general circumstances. And this is what was well known uh, for quite some time in the literature. Um, it's now going by the name of trivial decoupling, since decoupling arrived into the scene. Um, in particular, I want to draw your attention to the constant that we have here, which makes this inequality true. You have the number of subsets, capital N, and it's being raised to a certain power, the 1 minus 1 over P minus 1 over R power. And this is actually a sharp inequality in a certain context. Um, and this will be important for the decoupling results that will come up shortly because, in particular, this setting given to you here in bold uh, shows when it shows the limit, a definite limit for when we are not able to do uh, non trivial decoupling anymore. Uh, in particular, this statement can be worded in terms of a uh, necessity of avoiding lines or neighborhoods of lines. Um, if you get to a point where you are essentially your decoupling of some neighborhood of a manifold begins to look like you're decoupling a neighborhood of a line, then that's when you run into this barrier. So this is why decoupling results so far have all needed some sort of curvature for whatever set you're wanting to partition for decoupling purposes. Any questions before moving on? Okay. Right, so here is the formal definition of LR LP decoupling. You have uh, the same set S as before, broken up in our partition in two subsets, S1 through S capital N. And now you have the same inequality that I just provided to you on the previous slide, but the exponent here changes. It's no longer one minus one over P minus one over R. It's instead one half minus one over R. Uh, and you can check quickly that one minus one over P is larger than one half for all P larger than two. So this is indeed a positive gain. Um, but oh, I guess, uh, you know, there's a C here that we did not have before. And the form of C is what makes this inequality decoupling or not. Uh, we want the best such C, which we call the decoupling constant, to satisfy at most some epsilon dependence on N for all positive epsilon. Uh, so for this talk, uh, I say the relevant values of R will be two and P, it'll actually just be two. So that point, that bullet point was borrowed from another slide where we were uh, okay with having R being equal to P. Okay, so since we want R to be two for this talk, again, just to reiterate, proposition 1.1, the so-called trivial decoupling places limitations on L2. In particular, we have to avoid lines. All right, so what are the zero curvature and dimensional hypersurfaces that uh, are the subject of focus here? Um, you take the moment curve phi, and then you look at all of the n minus two derivatives. Uh, the derivatives of order one up to order n minus two. And then for each such derivative, you introduce a new parameter, si, and we extend by si along that derivative vector. And for in five dimensions, uh, this parameterization looks as so, uh, which may not seem too insightful, but there's actually interesting algebraic structure here, which makes it possible to decouple This algebraic structure can be encapsulated as a lemma. And this lemma makes iterative intermediate decoupling possible. Um, so we have some map which looks oddly familiar to Taylor series um, expansion. Uh, indeed, you are taking the derivatives of phi and then multiplying each such derivative evaluated at a certain time value or t value. You're multiplying that by the corresponding component of C. Um, now for this given map A, we will take some provided function F and compose the uh, Fourier transform of F with A to define some new function that we're calling FTO, or FTO hat rather in that uh, setting. And then the following statements are true. You apply A to the parameterization X, uh, the one that I gave you before. 
So just to refer back, x is the parameterization uh, mapping t s1 through sn minus 2 to what's given on the right. right. So when you apply a to that map, it corresponds to the parameterization with the same s values, but t is now moved by to. If a is defined according to to, then you're moving along the parameter you're moving the parameterization by TO in the T uh, component. In other words, A preserves the moment surface. Uh, and the second bullet point for this lemma tells us that A also preserves the LP norm for functions F. FTO and FP, or sorry, FTO and F have the same LP norm for all P positive. Um, and that's just change of variables combined with the fact that this map A has determinant one. And it's upper triangular. Uh, so upper triangular with ones all along the diagonal. All right, so then how this relates to decoupling is that if we have some function f that is Fourier supported in a neighborhood, just a delta neighborhood of a cap, a subset delta, um, in particular delta maps this Cartesian product of intervals or Cartesian product of an interval with various subsets so we don't really care about per se. Um, the Fourier support of FTO will be the delta neighborhood of this subset, which in particular has T now bounded by the length of the, the previous T interval. And that makes it possible for our decoupling error to be self-improving within certain iterative, iterative schemes. Okay, so with delta, the delta neighborhood of a moment surface defined as follows, um, just adding some sort of thickness to the moment surface by moving at most delta in the nth standard basis vector direction. Um, we have this result for all p between two and six. So the range is actually not dependent upon n here. Um, and so for all delta positive, there exists a decoupling partition comprised of caps according to the definition that was given at the beginning of this talk, um, such that we have this honest L2 LP decoupling inequality. Um, there is dependence upon the dimension, the ambient Euclidean dimension, uh, in addition to P, of course, and epsilon. But otherwise, our constant has at most the delta minus epsilon dependence concerning delta. Um, and in fact, this theorem holds more generally for surfaces of a form exactly analogous to our moment surface description, um, but where phi is now extended to be any non-degenerate CN minus one curve. Um, CN minus one because you only need that much smoothness in order to approximate this surface by moment surfaces, for which we're able to do things more, more hands-on. Um, and just to also give due credit, um, how, we extend, how we obtain that extension of theorem 2.2 for moment surfaces to the more general surfaces is by way of the usual prominent Seeger induction on scales. <coughs> All right, uh, so let us see how we can build upon our one tool for decoupling, um, ultimately resulting in theorem 2.2, right? So in 2014, John Bregan and Shipping and Demeter provided the first optimal L2 decoupling theorem. Um, they did this by building upon work of Thomas Wolf, who was the one to actually introduce decoupling, um, proving decoupling results, LP uh, decoupling results for the cone, but in a limited range of P. Uh, Bregan and Demeter arrived on the scene in 2014 with this theorem that proves decoupling for the paraboloid, the n minus one dimensional paraboloid. Um, what you do, in this context, as you break up the domain for your graphing function for the paraboloid, you break up that horizontal plane into subsets that are just basically squares of side length approximately delta to one half. Um, and then the subsets of the paraboloid that lie above those squares, we're calling those subsets tau. So tau lies in the paraboloid. Um, 
And then of course you have to have some kind of thickness so that there's a non-zero Euclidean volume for your subsets. Um, and then we're just projecting F along each or within each such delta neighborhood. Um, and then this honest L2 uh, LP decoupling inequality holds for all F that are Fourier supported in the delta neighborhood of the paraboloid. Um, I forgot to make one correction when going through my slides again. There should also be N dependence. So there should be epsilon P and N for the constant. Um, you can check this in their paper. They make mention of that. Okay, so for our work here, we just need that same theorem only in the two-dimensional setting. We just need the statement of decoupling for the parabola. Uh, and then by the usual um, extension to cylinders, we have uh, a decoupling tool that is fully available for use for our purposes. Um, so you take some parabola, some parabola in the CI, CI plus one coordinate plane, and then you just extend it cylindrically for all other components. Um, now the width of the same parabola in the CI, CI plus one coordinate plane, we're allowing that to be at most E, our neighborhood width. And then when we partition the CI axis into intervals I of length E to the one half, uh, this is reflected in this uh, dissection of the uh, parabolic cylinder, um, which is just basically a matter of restricting the parabolic cylinder to the part that lies within I for the CI variable. Uh, and we have this decoupling inequality. So to reiterate, this decoupling inequality comes by way of the Bourgain Demeter theorem that was just given to you, combined with Minkowski's uh, inequality, integral inequality, and Fubini. Yes, question. I just want to check to make sure I'm correct here. When you say C squared, that's also including the variables I plus Q all the way up to N as well, or is that just the first one? All right. Um, so C is some real value, and it's occupying the CI plus oh, one. So it's not even a vector. Right, okay. right. I see that is, yeah, I use C at the beginning of this talk as a vector and then I'm using it as a one dimensional variable. But yeah, that is the redundancy here. Or, yeah, yeah, double use of the same thing. Any other questions? Yeah. So the following key condition though, uh, right, so if we, you know, I'm introducing first. Uh, moment surface and then I'm moving on to we're moving on to another geometric object which is these parabolas and then from there there's another geometric object that's given to you all the parabolic cylinders you may be wondering how does any of this connect back to the first surface that we were given the moment surface right and that's a very valid question to ask um, you know how can you take two apparently very different geometries and find some sort of manner of comparison between them um, and for that, we resort to calculus. If the partial derivative of your composition of the Euclidean parameterization with the moment service parameterization, if that derivative is essentially one, especially if it's just mainly bounded from below, um, then you can deduce exactly analogous decoupling results from parabolic cylindrical decoupling for the moment surface decoupling. Um, right. So if this derivative is essentially one throughout whatever subset of our moment surface that we are wanting to decouple over, um, then our lemma from the previous slide deduces a decoupling result or uh, subsets delta prime that have t length e to the one half. So a reduced uh, t length in this case. Is that statement clear? <laughs> All 
Right, so in previous work, we proved this theorem in the case n equals three. Um, so this was done as one separate paper, and then the n equals four and higher case is a second paper that will be soon posted on archive. Um, and in that paper, the first one for the n equals three setting, uh, this is what our decoupling partition roughly looks like. It's also a picture of what the moment surface looks like in three dimensions. Um, one thing to notice is that, uh, first of all, the moment surface is broken up into sections um, where the caps all look roughly the same in terms of their dimensions. Uh, I mean, one thing that uh, perhaps immediately sort of posed conflict to you all when I gave the moment surface definition is that I had said initially that we wanted to avoid lines when doing L2 decoupling, but then the parameterization that I gave was comprised of lines um, for each T value, right? But what we do here is we merely partition the lines according to dyadic powers. So we break up the lines into line segments of some dyadic power between zero and one. Um, and then that's fine because all we're doing uh, is something that partitions into log of one over delta many subsets. And that certainly has delta minus epsilon times the epsilon loss. So that's perfectly fine to do. Now within each such subset where the line segment is some specified uh, dyadic power, uh, the T lengths of your caps, so that can be thought of as the length of your, your caps in the uh, tangent direction, or uh, this, maybe not the, tangent to the moment curve. <laughs> um, that direction, that dimension is uh, fixed. But in particular, uh, that length gets uh, increasingly larger as you move closer and closer to the moment curve. So as S goes down to zero, our caps are getting wider. And this is something that's pretty typical for this uh, type of decoupling over degenerate hypersurfaces. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Okay, so when this, perf this proof was first provided, uh, what was the main sort of engine there was a technique that amounted to local approximation of the two-dimensional moment surface by cones. Uh, one wanted to use, we wanted to use algebra and Taylor expansion um, to provide this form of the C3 variable over the moment surface. Um, one thing you'll notice maybe is that the uh, term here after three halves that is the graph of a cone, but one that's been rotated by 45 degrees. So that it's now tangent to the coordinate hyperplane, the uh, horizontal coordinate hyperplane. Um, but uh, if you've, you know, have some familiarity with the work of Bourgain and Demeter, how they prove decoupling for the paraboloid and then also uh, decoupling for the cone shortly after in the same paper, um, is they make this observation that cones are uh, approximate bow locally by parabolic cylinders. So certain sections of the cone, they look like parabolic cylinders. And so theoretically it's possible to just provide a proof for this moment surface decoupling that focuses directly on that same fact, that same insight. And indeed, if you take the square of the C2 variable over the moment surface and you examine its difference with the C3 variable, we have this, uh, expression here. Um, now the TQ term is really good error for decoupling. Uh, if you look at um, the various error power or what would happen, um, let's say your T interval is some L as length L, then initially, and L is also less than one, um, then initially this term would be L to the third power, you apply decoupling that become, that provides to you uh, subsets of T length L to the three halves. And then you plug that back in, you would now have L to the three halves times three. Take the square root of that, it will now be L to the three halves squared. Um, 
Essentially what happens is that you, at each step of the iteration, are getting caps of t length l to the 3 halves to some n power. And that goes down to delta by log of log of 1 over delta. Um, so it will take log of log 1 over delta many steps to reduce this to delta. Um, and that's, that's perfectly fine number of steps for iteration in terms of providing the usual loss and the decoupling constant that we're okay with. But it's this term here, where two is exactly the reciprocal of one half. That term poses a problem initially. And so we would like to make three minus four s, our coefficient here, we would like to make that small relative to delta. And our hope is that we can do that by means of some intermediate decoupling combined with rescaling. Any questions about what I've said? Okay, so as before, we partition our two-dimensional moment surface. By the way, we are in the uh, section where the proof of theorem 2.2, the main result, is being provided to you in three dimensions, and we'll move into four plus dimensions soon. Um, but yes, in three dimensions, what we can do is we may partition the two-dimensional moment surface into annuli of this form. So in particular, the main point is that the S variable alone is being restricted to some dyadic interval. Uh, so in particular, S is essentially to the minus K. Um, and then now this inequality, which is our first step towards decoupling, that is just a simple matter of triangle plus the triangle inequality plus Schroeder. Um, and then from this point forward, it suffices to examine decoupling for each annuli term, annulus term. Uh, now, looking at the difference of C1 squared with C2 over the moment surface, we have that it is exactly equal to minus S squared, which we know to be essentially two to the minus two K. And, and magnitude. Um, and then we can apply our uh, lemma 2.5, our uh, combination of parabolic cylindrical decoupling with the key derivative condition that was mentioned to you, um, to, do, to deduce this decoupling inequality where our subsets delta one uh, now have reduced T length of being at most to the minus K, of being exactly to the minus K. By the way, if it's not been clear, uh, what is the main goal for producing our decoupling theorem? Um, is that, again, we can't do more for the S variables than restrict them to some dyadic interval. That's, that's the best way we can do because those S variables correspond to lines. Um, their coordinate curves are lines. But uh, what we can do, what is the, the point, um, is to reduce the length for our T variable. And so we will be uh, preoccupied with reducing that length to the smallest possible value. So initially, uh, or at this point in the procedure, we have to the minus k, uh, but we can do much better than that because that length should actually be some expression involving delta. And delta is not present at the moment for our t length. So we look to further partition our delta ones that have the length to, uh, to the minus k for t. Um, and then we do something that might seem a bit strange at first. We uh, further partition, we actually do further partition the s interval. Um, but again, just something that is a small step um, so that we're not incurring too much loss in the decoupling constant. So instead of having intervals for s that are uh, to the minus k in length, we restrict so that the length is now to the minus k delta epsilon. That's fine because there will at most be uh, delta to the minus epsilon many subintervals um, for each delta one. Um, now the reason why you know we're taking something so specific and this and obtaining uh, the consequent inequality <coughs> is that we can apply a dilation to um, each new cap delta two that was obtained. 
so that the image of that dilation on delta two will be a new subset delta prime still contained in the moment surface, having bounded T length. So our rescaling doesn't blow up T, which is a very crucial requirement. Um, the neighborhood length will be enlarged to some delta prime. That doesn't matter because um, basically because the properties of a fine invariance for the Fourier transform, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, just you need to keep track of what delta prime is and then when you work things back to your original setting, um, whatever you got for the delta prime case, the corresponding value in the original setting will be what you expected. Um, another way of wording what I'm trying to say is that if you uh, move your decoupling problem into a different context by means of some affine uh, linear map, and you obtain the so-called optimal decoupling caps, um, so these will be your subsets that look essentially like <laughs> rectangular boxes, lines going in every, every single direction. Um, then when you take the, the inverse image of those same caps, they will still be flat in the same sense, uh, almost rectangular. Okay. But the key point that uh, was the whole driving force behind applying D in the first place is that the S parameter will be within essentially delta epsilon of three over four, uh, corresponding to what we wanted. Um, here we have three minus four S, and we wanted to make that small. So that's essentially the same as making S close to uh, three over four. And we have that it's actually delta epsilon within three over four. So that now our difference from before has this new form. Um, for points in the delta neighbor in the delta prime neighborhood of our rescaled cap, um, our difference between the squared C two and C three for points in such delta prime neighborhood uh, will be O of delta prime plus now an O of delta epsilon times T square factor, and then the O of T cubed. Um, so when you're dealing with terms. Uh, whose exponent is exactly the reciprocal of what um, size reduction is obtained by means of decoupling, uh, you need that com component to be delta to some epsilon power um, in order to apply iterative decoupling and reduce that term to O of delta, or O of delta prime in this case. Um, so if you repeatedly apply the parabolic cylindrical decoupling uh, that is implied by 10, um, so you take the delta prime and you <laughs> choose the supremum of this expression on the right over delta prime, apply the parabolic centrical decoupling, get smaller caps, then you look at the supremum of the same expression over those smaller caps, and then apply the parabolic centrical decoupling again to get even smaller caps. Um, that will produce increasingly smaller subsets of these provided T lengths. Uh, first, it will be caps of T length delta epsilon, then caps of T length delta two epsilon, moving all the way down to delta prime. You have to hope that the number of steps for which this will be required is not too large. One over epsilon is fine. Um, any inverse power of epsilon would be fine as long as that power is fixed. <laughs> uh, yeah. And this type of iterative decoupling was first demonstrated by Brigade and Demeter for conical decoupling. Uh, but again, it has the prominent Zeger uh, method of induction on scales as its uh, foundation or as the core idea. Any questions? Okay. All right, but now if we want to take the same methodology and extend it into the higher dimensional setting, uh, just even at the first step, we run into something new an additional degree of complexity. So we can do, uh, right, so if we look at the C3 minus C2 squared expression for the three-dimensional moment surface, we have a new term. Um, this four minus S2 squared is also new, I guess, but that actually will be the target T length for the procedure that is uh, necessary in this setting. So that, that's fine, that's what we want actually. It just takes the place of delta from before. 
Um, what is problematic initially is this t term, because not only is that not t squared, um, it's an exponent uh, smaller than two. But we are saved by the fact that the coefficient on the t term is our target t length, s2. So it's just a matter of tracing out whether or not we can apply the same sort of iteration with t, though, uh, being the new point of focus. And indeed, if we apply parabolic centrical decoupling as before, we have a similar pattern, or we have a pattern in the exponents for our successive t lengths. Um, it's just the partial sums of the geometric series with ratio 1 half. Uh, and we know that that converges to 1 when the starting value is 1 half. So, you know, it'll take infinitely many steps to actually get to 1. We can't do that for obvious reasons. But what we can do is get within epsilon of 1. Um, and that will occur in log of 1 over epsilon many steps, which is, again, perfectly fine, <coughs> perfectly okay number of steps. Um, and then once we get to caps of, si of t length s2 to the 1 minus epsilon, we want those lengths to be s2, but we can just apply the usual triangle inequality combined with Holder to reduce from s2 1 minus epsilon to s2 to the 1 power. Um, yeah, and so once we do that, then the caps of size of t length s2 are small enough to be rescaled. Um, yeah, rescaled to a setting where the uh, final um, the final parabolic cylindrical approximation provides the honest uh, decoupling result that we want it, the final one. So this difference is um, just some polynomial in uh, S2 now. Plus terms that are all at least uh, power three, exponent three. <laughs> and as before, this polynomial, so P is a polynomial, quadratic polynomial. And this can be made small. So that, again, by the same prominent Seeger induction on scales, um, we can make this term along with this term O of delta prime. And then the final decoupling with respect to O of delta prime as the neighborhood width will deduce the caps of t length delta prime to the 1 half. Um, and then we just uh, apply our various uh, rescaling maps. Um, the inverse of them to those caps to uh, obtain our final caps that we wanted for the original setting. Okay, that is my talk. Thank you.